my good friend Jack Parker. Uh, I don't know what to do except hide after that <laughs> introduction. Anyway, this is, most people read about William's March of Destruction, and then they read about Blue Savannah, and those are two separate things. Except when I put them on the map, I discovered they're probably connected. So that's what this presentation is about. Well, this map shows Georgetown in the lower left-hand corner. And Weems was one of Cornwallis's fair-haired boys. So he was given the job of starting a Georgetown militia. He had two lieutenant colonels, one named Castles, and the other one was William Henry Mills. Now Mills lived up on the east side of the P.D. River about where Shara or Society Hill is in that area. But he was in Georgetown for starting and helping with this to build the militia. Everything I ever read said Castles and Mills uh, at, were attacked by, it was a mutiny really, by the people in their militia after Weems left. Well, I've been staring at it for 12 years. It didn't make any sense. Why did Weems get away and the other guy didn't? So I found out, and I'll pass that on to you. I just found out last, oh, about a week ago. <laughs> uh, there's a moral in that. You can look at something or read something over and over, and you'll miss the key point in it over and over. So just because you think you know it, you probably don't. Uh, down in the lower right-hand corner, it says Mills departed 7-6-1780. Well, he had to leave about that time, and that's why he didn't get captured. He wasn't there. Uh, he lived up by Sherall. He was an American, just like Bloody Bill Cunningham, and then he changed sides. He changed sides when, Char when Charleston fell to the British in 1780. And he stayed on that side until he quit. Uh, so that's why he wasn't there, why he wasn't captured. Hunt's Bluff, that's in Marlboro County. The British were sending the 71st sick and wounded down to Charleston on the P.D. River. Uh, Tristan Thomas didn't have a cannon and he wanted to intercept the boats and take them prisoner. So he cut a couple of palmetto logs and set them up like they were cannons. And he gave them an ultimatum. He either surrendered or I'm going to blow you out of the water. They quit. They surrendered. <laughs> Guess who the commander was? It was old Lieutenant Colonel Mills. That's why he had to go back up to Sherall. So that happened on 725, 1780. And you keep these things kind of in your mind because they'll come up later. Down in the lower right, uh, yeah, right hand corner again, is Wings departed about 812, 1780. He got orders to go to Camden because Gates had come into South Carolina. He got as far as Nelson's Ferry, that's the lower left-hand side, about 8, 18, 1780. Camden was fought on the 16th. So he was late for that. Cornwallis then sent him up to the high hills of the Santee. That's up in the top left up here. He stayed there until he got orders from Cornwallis on 8-29-1780 to go after the people between the Santee and the P.D. Rivers. It's your turn. Okay. 
She gets to do the reading for me. <laughs> Weems received orders from Lord Cornwallis to sweep the country. I don't think your mic's working. Oh, it is. Don't worry. Okay. I just had it lower than yours. <laughs> uh, the country from King Street Bridge to the PD and returned by the Charles. Charles, sorry. I would have you disarm in the most rigid manner all persons that you cannot depend on and punish the concealment of arms and ammunition with the total demolition of their plantation, demol yeah, de their plantations. All those who had voluntarily enrolled themselves in Colonel Mills or Colonel Gaylord's corps and afterwards joined the rebels must be immediately hanged up unless you should seize a great number, in which case you will please select the properest the properest ob objects for mercy. All those who either submitted themselves or lived quietly on their plantations in an apparent acquiescence to the king's government and have joined in this second revolt must have their property entirely taken from them or destroyed and themselves taken prisoners of war. Wow. That's from the big man himself. No. Major James Meems was acting commander of the British 63rd Regiment. Lord Cornwallis's letter to General Clinton stated, Major Weems is going to, with a detachment of the 63rd Regiment mounted, some refugees, provincials, and militia to disarm in the most rigid manner the country between Santee and PD, and to punish severely all those who submitted or pretended to live peaceably under His Majesty's government since the reduction of Charlestown and have joined in this second revolt. And I ordered him to hang up all those militiamen who were concerned in seizing their officers and capturing the sick of the sick of the 71st Regiment. I have myself ordered several militiamen to be executed who had voluntarily enrolled themselves and borne arms with us and afterwards revolted with, to the enemy. The 71st Militia was Tristan Thomas. Just two or three weeks before, that captured the British. So you can tell that Cornwallis was a little bit upset with what the Americans were doing. In addition, and I'm sorry I skipped over this on the slide before, uh, let me back up. Ah. You can see Great Savannah down in the lower left-hand corner. <clears throat> Francis Marion took 200 prisoners from the Maryland line away from the British. They were being transported from Camden down to Charleston as prisoners of war. Uh, this happened on 8-25-1780. And you notice that he issued orders to Williams on 7, uh, 8 25, 29. So only four days difference. This one kind of put the icing on the cake for Cornwallis. Of the 200, about 176 decided they'd rather be prisoners than go with Marion. Five or six decided we'll join Marion. They lasted about a week. And if you what happened, uh, you'll see later on, that Marion sent them to Wilmington, North Carolina, along with his prisoners and the 200 from the American line, uh, Maryland line. I'm sorry, I forgot that before. Here's who comprised Weems Force. 100 men from Weems British 63rd Regiment. 100 loyalists from Colonel John Hamilton's best men to be ordered to be sent to Wings by Cornwallis. Cornwallis assigned Loyalist militia to reinforce the Wings 63rd, probably from Harrison's Loyalist militia and or Colonel Samuel Times' Loyalist militia. Captain Amos Gaskins was a member of Times Militia. Gaskins is the one that pointed out the plantations of all the different people that were in the Georgetown Militia and turned against the British. So it was probably uh, Times uh, Militia that assisted Weems. 
This is just a general map to give you an idea of what we're going to discuss. It's a 1776 map. It has all the pertinent places on it. You can see the high hills of the Santee, etc. And we'll break it down and go part by part. Uh, Weems received his orders on the 29th, but he did not march until September 5th. There are 81 days in August. So he fiddled around for seven days or seven and a half days. Uh, at first I had him camped at, uh, down here at Canty's plantation. Oops, there's Canty's. Just because a lot of people camped there when they were marching between places. And two days ago I discovered he was in Williamsburg at night. And I knew this for 12 years too. So Canty says he couldn't have camped there. It's too close to Williamsburg. So he probably camped somewhere from Richardson's. He was a general in the American Army. And somewhere down in here. Uh, the most likely place is Jack's Creek, which is close to Summerton, which is off I-95. <clears throat> so he camped there on the 5th. On the 6th, he was marching through Williamsburg, which is all the way over here. Uh, in Williamsburg, uh, there was a Major John James was one of the uh, officials or officers for Mary. Now you got to understand, Marion had troops all over the eastern half of South Carolina, and they acted as spies. So he knew if you walked out your front door after breakfast, Marion knew about it. <laughs> he he knew where all the opposite forces were. He knew where all of his forces were. The God, the uh, references say that on the evening of the 6th, or at night, uh, Williams marched through King Street. We, uh, James was hiding out and counting the number of British so he could pass it on to Mary. As the tail end stragglers came by, he attacked. He captured or killed about 30 of the um, Wings militia. That didn't make Cornwallis, Cornwallis very happy either. So now the red line, by the way, is the march route from the 1776 map that Wings probably used in his march because armies always traveled on roads rather than through swamps and thickets and forests. Uh, you can see in the lower left-hand side, there's uh, Williams Indian Town and McGill's. Three red boxes. Well, the British by now knew that uh, John James had captured 30 of the Williams people. So he wanted to uh, make an example of James. He went to his house. He wasn't there. So they asked his wife, and said, where's your husband? And she replied, I have no control over that man. And he's not here. I have no idea where he is. They laid siege to the house for about three days, uh, not allowing any food or anything else in. But one of Wayne's men, through a back window, passed food to her and her children. After three days, they hauled all the furniture out of the house and burned the house down. And this is just a little side note that I find interesting. There was an attorney in Hemingway who, almost with his last breath, helped me find where John James lived. He had a brother that bought some property on the same creek. And we nailed it down and probably within a week he died from cancer 
and I'm sorry it happened so long ago I can't remember his, his name. Uh, you probably have heard of Indian Town. Weems or one of his men stated, this is a house of sedition. Because all of the uh, Episcopal churches were the king's property. So none of those got burned. But if you were any other domination, it was called a meeting house, and one of them happened to be an Indian town, and they burned it. Probably most of you have seen the movie called The Patriot, where they burned a church with people inside. I have found nothing in 22 years where the British or the Americans ever burned a church with people inside. But they did burn the Indian Town Church, and that's why. Because it was a meeting house, and it was right in the middle of Marion's territory. You can also see McGill's. That's the red dot, or square, closer to the right-hand side of the page. McGill's is still there, and I've been told it's the original house. But if you go there, it's now up on a paved road, and it's owned by a doctor. Uh, I wouldn't really go knocking on the door. But back during the Revolution, about halfway from where the house is now, down to the swamp, is the original location of the house. And I think there's a couple of trees in the middle of the field growing up there. So, uh, John James was in the area because he shot from the road at the British camp at McGill's. Of course, that didn't make them very happy either, but they didn't catch James. Uh, after that, they marched up the line of the red. Now, if you see the red on the right-hand side, there's a little red square just north of it. That's was a house of a man named Savage. They burned his house. He wasn't home. But they burned his house. Uh, probably most of you know that there was a, a house where the British were ensconced and somebody shot an arrow on the roof and set the house on fire. The person that shot that arrow was Savage. That happened about a year after his house was burned. Now you can see the red line goes across Britain's ferry and stops. In one of Marion's letters, he said, Weems crossed Britain's ferry and came back the same night. Now that doesn't make any sense. Why would a guy move his army up all the way across the ferry and then turn around and come back? One of the rules in the Revolutionary War, and probably still, is you keep water between you and your enemy. That way you have more time to get away. He knew that Marion was on the east side of the P.D. River. So he went across, dropped some troops off, and came back across so that Marion would think he had a river between his enemy and himself. <clears throat> that makes sense. A lot of the people that had their houses burned were on the east side of the Petey River. And you've got to remember that Weems had three to four hundred men. So he dropped a bunch off when he was down in Indian Town to lay siege to James's house. They stayed there. Weems kept moving. So now we have British forces on both sides of the P.D. River. And there's something else I've forgotten, one of those slides way back in the beginning, but you'll see it later on. There's also a third British force coming up on the east side of the little P.D. River, just in case Mary tried to get away that way. All right, he came back across Britain's Ferry, which is just to the south of this slide. He went back up, and you probably all heard about Adam Cusack. 
He was hanged by wings in society. <clears throat> and I've got to fill you in a little history here. The American version of why Adams, or Cusack, was hung was number one, he shot at a slave owned by Brockington, who was on the British side. They shot across Black Creek. The other is that he refused to take British officers across Black Creek on his ferry. So, in my mind anyway, that's pretty well be debunked. After the war, the Americans kept bad-mouthing wings. So he wrote a letter back to this country and he said, I hung wings because he shot at an officer coming to join me and stole his horse. And he's a deserter from the British Navy. Deserting the British Navy is a hanging offense. That's why it was hung. And again, after I did maybe the second edition, I gave a talk at Darlington County. The young man, but younger than I am, uh, <laughs> happened to have a copy of the plaque for Adam Cusack. And it located, and that location on the map is within a hundred yards. If you ever, if you ever go there, have been over Highway 327 that goes up to I-95. There's a bridge over Black Creek. On the right-hand side, going north, is where Cusack would have lived. You could throw a rock across Black Creek. But the important part, on that plat, it says a bridge, not a ferry. So that pretty well debunks the American reasons for hanging Cusack. Uh, the other red dots that are on there are my guess as to where plantations were burned. Except for right up at the top, almost in the center, is Jordan and Gibson. Up here. Oh, there you go. There you go. That, was, that man was named in person, so I I know that's somebody that had his house plantation burned. And the, the word plantation down here means a great big property. In those days, all it meant was a farm. So it could have been three or four acres. Wings went up to Society Hill. Now you see a black line on the other side of the river. That's the men that were supposed to get married. And again, there were some Wiggins or Wigans that had their houses burned. That's what a lot of my red dots are. That's just where they lived. In Society Hill, uh, Williams stopped and had a trial for Adam Cusack. He was found guilty and hanged by Williams. There was a doctor Wilson, that inter tried to intervene to keep him from hanging well, uh, Adam Cusack. For that, he had his house burned. So Williams also burned Dr. Wilson's house. His family tried to uh, entreat, uh, maybe that's not the right word, anyway, they tried to stop the hanging by pleading to Williams. And Williams charged his horse at them. There was uh, somebody that grabbed the reins of the horse before he could trample anybody. So, Williams, that's the only time I ever heard that Williams was really a bad dude. Because he only hung one person, and that was Cusack. Then there, you see the name DeWitt out there just next to the, doctor, the doctor's house. DeWitt was an American who supplied cattle and food to the Patriot forces. His house was burned also for that reason. And he had a, a big plantation down in Florence County along River Road 
There used to be a, a sign, if you ever drive from Florence south to that big intersection that I guess takes you over to the beach. On the, the left-hand side going south, there's a historical marker, or there was, about DeWitt's. So that's, that's where DeWitt went. All right, it's your turn to read. I didn't know about this one. <laughs> Cornwallis sent Major James Weems against Marion to burn the homes of Marion's men and hang those he caught. Marion decided to break up his militia and flee to the White Marsh, North Carolina. Weems used Loyalist Captain Amos Gaskins, who was an evil man whose soul had been soiled by hatred, to identify the rebel homes and cause the Presbyterian Church at Indian Town to be burned. Weems killed sheep and cattle and destroyed mills and blacksmith shops and allowed British units to plunder at will. And hung Adam Cusack for breaking parole and deserting the British Navy and burned the home of Dr. James Wilson, who attempted to prevent Cusack's hanging. In Weems' words, burnt and laid waste about 50 houses and plantations, mostly belonging to people who have either broken their paroles or oaths of allegiance and are now in arms against us. The list was found and destroyed by General Thomas Sumter at Fish Dam Ford. Weems described his orders as a very disagreeable but necessary duty. I'm going to throw one thing in here. Sumter did burn the list that he found in Weems' pocket. The reason he burned it was if any of his men ever found that list, they would have hanged Weems. Weems was a good candidate for trading to the British, so he had to keep him alive. That's why the list got burned. But he burned approximately 50 plantations. Why did Weems fail to capture Mary? Now here, you have to apply a little bit of thinking between the lines. Poor coordination between Ganey who lived on west on Catfish Creek. That's in Marion County, just north and west of Marion. Underestimating we, uh, Marion, that's a big factor. And Blue Savannah. Y'all catch fireflies when you're kids? If you did, you know you have to have a lid on the jar or the fly, fireflies are gonna get away. That's the same principle that's in play here. Now, you see the, maybe it's hard for you to see up there, the red line, the black line, and the blue line. The red line are the British forces. The blue line that goes up the little PD is the Georgetown militia, what's left of it. The kind of blue dot with a line down is where Katie lived on Catfish, Catfish Creek. And way up here, way up here, you see a little tiny red dot. I don't know if you can read it from where you are, but the name is Barfield. That's where Barfield lived. Everything I ever read didn't mention Barfield until about a week ago. I found a pension statement from the wife of somebody, and I'll get into that later when we get there. So anyway, this is the whole route that shows you where everybody was and they went. Now we'll break it down. I'll read this one. You go for it. Remember we, we talked about the 200 from the Maryland line that Marion captured? That's what his first sentence is about. I sent the prisoners I took on the 25th of August with the Continentals to Wilmington. This is a letter written by Marion on 9-15. Blue Savannah happened on 9-4. So it's within two weeks of the action. This is about as good a source as you can get. On the third instant, I had advice that upwards of 200 Tories intended to attack me the next day. 
And this is where they didn't count on Marion. I immediately marched with 52 men, which is all I could get. On the 4th in the morning, I surprised a party of 50, 45 men, which I mistook for the main body. Let me explain, and you'll see it on maps later. That was the advance guard for Gaines troops. And they would have been camped on the north side of the creek because they wanted to keep water between Marion and them, just in case. I killed or wounded all but 15 which escaped. I then marched immediately to attack the main body, which I met about three miles in full march toward me. Remember that part. We're going to look at the old historical marker and some of the mistakes in it. I directly attacked them and put them to flight. Though they had 200, I got and got into an impassable swamp to all the Tories. And I had one man wounded in the first action, three in the second, and two horses killed. Finding it impossible to get at them, I retreated to camp, went back to Port Ferry. The next day, I was informed they were all dispersed. On the 5th, I was joined by about 60 men. I then withdrew, I then drew up a small redoubt to secure my camp from being surprised by the Tories should they again collect. Those Tories were scattered so bad, they never again became a fighting force. And they were on Highway 41. Now you can see where the advance guard is at the lower star on Reedy Creek, keeping the creek between them and Marion. Blue Savannah is up where the upper star is, was on 9-4. If you measure that on a map, depending on how good you are, it's exactly 3 miles or 3.1 miles. So his that? Estimated three miles were pretty close. And you can you can see Marion up there. And on the left hand side, well, maybe it's your right hand side. Uh Gaines a wet fit, catfish creek. Marion County was a hotbed for Tories and Loyalists. Uh, just north of Marion, there was a Tarts Mill. That was another hotbed. They're the group that went up and killed Colonel Cobb in Marlboro County. So, but in all my reading, I never found anything until a week ago that had mentioned Barfield, except for the historical markers. And you can see at the top other corner, uh, Barfield lived way up Highway 41. These are what uh, savannas look like. There's three of them. These three are on the north side of Highway 501. And you can see in the lower part it says Blue Savannah is a Carolina Bay. A Carolina Bay is made up like this. It has a sand ridge. Uh, it's got, most of them have water in it and they have gravel and sand at, on the bottom. Now, this one, you can see Blue Savannah. I'm going to run the pointer around it. Can you see the sand? Yeah. So it's, it goes from about here to here. And Highway 41 went through the middle. It got its name, Blue Savannah, from the blue-gray clay that stuck to the wagon wheels when they would go through it. It had about knee-deep water in it. This is the, the original sign. This was there maybe 20 years ago, 15 years ago. 
One quarter mile south of the site, Francis Mary defeated a band of Tories under Captain Barfield. On August 13th, number one, I never read anything that said Captain Barfield, except this. The date's wrong. He feigned a retreat. That's wrong because Marion said, I attacked them straight on. <laughs> so he didn't draw them into a trap. Oh, that sign was relocated when they made Highway 40, 501 four lanes. And they didn't put it back at Aerial Crossroads, which would have made it a quarter mile south. Instead, they put it about a half a mile toward Myrtle Beach. And being young and dumb, I drove a big van back in there and discovered that's Back Bay. And the ditches that they put in are about eight feet deep. And it's wide enough for one car to go on the ridge with a ditch that deep on both sides. So don't drive in there. <laughs> uh, I, they made a new historical marker, and I didn't have a copy of it. I hadn't photographed it. But Bill Seegers, I hope I said his name right, uh, they're photographing historical markers all over the state. He sent these to me. This is the new one. And it is on Highway 41, not at the crossroads, but almost exactly where the action took place. And I'm going to, I need to explain to you where it took place. Blue Savannah is a big area. But you got to remember, Marion is coming up from the south. Uh, Ganey and Barfield are coming down from the north. And when he attacked them directly, why didn't they run back up the road? Because they were on the south side of the savannah. The clay and the water would have slowed their horses. That's where you have to put a little common sense into some of these actions. You won't find it, find it written down word for word. You have to think about it. So that's why they turned and went into Back Swamp because it was the only avenue they had. To turn the other way would have been high ground and they probably would have been caught and a lot more killed. Uh, do you want me to read the historical marker or have you read it? I guess you've all read it, right? Okay. Uh, anyway, this one says Captain Jesse Barfield again. So I got the, I went online, and previously, I've been doing this for about 22 years, I had never found anything that had Barfield being a commander. Except when I went online, I found a pension statement from well, let me go. Let me see. Let me, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is the back side of the sign. In the second skirmish, roughly three miles, which it was, uh, in the vicinity of Carolina Bay, known as Blue Savannah, Marion again attacked and dispersed a larger uh, detachment of t about 200 loyalists. Marion's victory was encouraged, had here encouraged. Uh, new recruits to join his force, which they did, because about 60 people joined him. But this next statement I take issue with. The reinforcements of local Tory militia, they weren't Tory militia. It was a British army with wings and militia. However, soon forced the Patriot leaders to withdraw from here up to North Carolina. Uh, maybe some of you noticed I'm doing a lot of shaking. I have a central tremor. My hands never stop. And it gets worse as you get older. I'm at the age now where I can no longer put red lines over these roads. It comes out a mess. So this is something that I just added in the last week. It shows you where Port Ferry was. And 
Marion would have taken the road from Porch Ferry up to Highway 41 and taken Highway 41 up to the advance guard on the north side of Reedy Creek, which he killed about 30 of them, 15 got away. And then three miles up to, to Blue Savannah. Now this, this is, it may be an 1825 map, it shows black uh, back swamp, kind of narrow. It's not, it runs almost up to Highway 41. There's enough room for one row of houses between the swamp and the road. So they disappeared into the swamp. Marion didn't chase them in there. You can see it would be high ground if they had gone the other way, or they had to be on the south side of the swamp because of the clay in the water would have slowed them down. So if any of you are metal detector people, go up there, look around the new sign that's up, you're going to find some artifacts. Got to be. And that sign, that uh, savanna where you could barely see the sand rim, that's after 250 years of plowing and planting. So it's, it's still there. This is just a close-up. And the thing you want to notice is B, Muirland. You see that on the long side of the road? He lived there. He was one of Marion's officers. And I didn't know that until about a week ago. His wife filed a pension statement. Back during the Revolution and after that, pension statements now would be called Social Security. Uh, people that fought in the revolution could get a pension and after they died their wives could get a pension. His wife filed for a, a pension 65 years after the Battle of Boozman. You look like you know it is. Uh, anyway, uh, I have a copy, I didn't put it in this presentation, but I have a copy of that uh, I think she made it in 1846, maybe, or 45, and you always had to have a witness on a pension statement that said, this happened, it was true, these people were involved, and so he should get the pension. The person that gave the witness was dated a year later, so it made me suspect Number one, wives are not really good at remembering things because the husbands are actually the ones who did the fighting and they would remember, I got shot or almost shot, whatever. But being that B. B Moonerman, his first name was Benjamin Moonerman, was one of the people involved in Blue Savannah. And the fact that it was his wife She's the only one I ever met to mention Barfield. So her husband must have told, told her that Barfield was part of the group. And that may, that may be the last slide. Oh, here we go back with all those things again. Uh, Hunt's Bluff is right up there where the pointer is, that blue star. That's the first thing that got Cornwallis excited. Then the next thing is all the way down at the bottom where it says Great Savannah. That was a month later when 200 of the Maryland line were captured, <coughs> taken away from the bridge by Marion. And then you can see the high hills of the Santee. The red line is Weems March. Weems actually got to Sherall uh, on the 10th of September, but he didn't write a letter to his boss until the 20th. And the reason being, he had to wait for all the other troops to come in that were burning down different plantations and that sort of thing. So, just like your firefly jar. You had three forces coming up from the south. 
So Mary could have just run due north and stayed ahead of them. But Blue Savannah, and I have found nothing to back this up. Maybe one of you has, but there's no doubt in my mind it will show up sometime in the future. Highway 41 goes to White Marsh, and that's where Marion fled to. He just went up Highway 41. Blue Savannah happened on Highway 41. So I think that uh, Gaines Force and Barfield were to work in conjunction with Weems. Weems was commanding all these people coming up from the south. But it took him seven to seven and a half days to leave the high hills. Now, I, I got wondering why he took so much time. He, well, granted, he had militia ordered to accompany him, to accompany him, but as best I can determine, all of, they, all of them were within 30 miles of the high hills. And uh, Tynes, three weeks after this happened, Tynes was involved in the Battle of Terracote Swamp. So he was down in Clarendon County, in that area, around Marion, uh, that sort of thing. I have nothing official that ties Ganey to Cornwallis or to Weems, but there's no doubt in my mind it had to be coordinated. Otherwise, Marion would have just gotten away. And the British knew where Marion was too. That's why Weems crossed at Britain's Ferry and then came back. He wanted Marion to think, we got a river between us, I'm safe. And I think that's it. Oops. We got a little more for the reader here. Thank you. <laughs> Major James Weems received his orders on August 29, 1780 when he was in the high hills of, Santee, of the Santee. He did not march until September 5th, 1780. This delay may have caused him to arrive in the area of Ports Ferry too late to trap Marion with Ganey closing the top of the trap. Or perhaps Ganey marched too soon. He may have been ordered to get close to Marion and monitor his position, etc., until Weems arrived. In any case, Weems and Ganey underestimated <coughs> Marion. Marion learned of Ganey's plans planned movements and marched to take the fight to him on September 4th, 1780. The result was a total surprise to Ganey and the lid to Weems trap was eliminated. When Weems arrived on September 9th, 1780, Ganey's men had been so badly scattered that they were no longer a fighting force, leaving the road to White Marsh, North Carolina open that allowed Marion's escape. If Blue Savannah had not happened or been lost by Marion, the outcome of the Revolutionary War may have been very different, since there would have been a real possibility of Marion's capture by Weems, who had orders to hang him. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> there was something else I was going to say, but I forgot what it was. Getting old is not fun. Your mind goes to pieces. Uh, I, I really think, and this is just my personal opinion, remember in the beginning I told you Weems was Cornwallis' fair hair boy? I think Weems kind of had the thought in the back of his head that I can do no wrong. It, it doesn't, if, if he had marched in about three days, which is normally what it takes to, actually they May camp and road camp on marches every day. So three days is generous time to, to march. That would have put him there right at about the time of Blue Savannah. But he didn't. He, he waited to march. And then uh, I went back and checked the dates of when Gates came into South Carolina. He came in about the 25th of July, which is, um, what, 10 or 12 days before we, uh, yeah, Weems March 
from Georgetown and got as far as Nelson's Ferry, and it was all over. So he seemed to be rather slow, and I don't know when he got his orders from Georgetown to go to Canada. Uh, there must be a date somewhere. But in both cases, he seemed rather slow to me to decide to get up off his duff and march. Anyway, had he left sooner, he, they would have probably gotten married. But the big thing that they did not count on was Marion. He took the fight to them. Everybody expected him to stay seated where he was, maybe throw up a little defensive mound or something. But he went with 52 men against 200. And he totally surprised them because they didn't think he was going to do it. And he threw out his campaign, he did things like that. One comes to mind that he was somewhere up around Berkeley County and went 60 miles in one night to attack the enemy. They didn't expect it. He won. Except he did play a, a busket, busket, busket there, ambush. But he always did the unexpected. And I think the British and the Tory militia had a hard time accepting all of that. Uh, and there's the grand old book. <laughs> if you have any questions about it, maybe they'll answer them. If you have any questions about any of this or anything else, I'll be here until the last of you leave. So feel free to ask away.